let's dive right in. Uh, this morning we saw a number of uh, of drivers being mentioned that uh, will influence the, the future of your uh, industry. Um, my talk is starting from uh, climate change, energy transition, that's what we focus on at Future Proofed, uh, but seeing it as an opportunity rather than just as a threat. Because I, I really believe that in the coming decades, this will be the biggest challenge to deal with. It will actually shape our society and our economy. But it will also sort the winners from the losers, because we see it as the biggest business opportunity uh, in the century. So, so the companies and cities and nations that embrace this proactively uh, will get ahead. Others who don't adapt will be the, the fossils uh, of the future. And that's what uh, this talk is about. And also, hopefully, it's going to give you some inspiration for the workshop we're going to do uh, right after. Um, so the energy transition is here. Again, it's, it's something that's gone way beyond the realm of Greenpeace and, and WWF and environmentalists, etc. It's actually on the agenda of the world's most uh, powerful leaders, the uh, world's uh, top economic and political leaders who come together in Davos uh, uh, every year. And, and for 12 years or more, they've uh, published uh, uh, this report called um, the global risk landscape, and they actually map out uh, risks that will affect the global economy in the next 10 years. And they map them out on the likelihood of occurrence and the impact their impact on the global economy. And if you take a closer look, it's interesting to see which factors, which risks are most likely to happen. Of course, they've been happening for decades, but also have the highest impact on uh, the global economy. Natural disaster, extreme weather events, failure uh, to uh, adapt for, uh, uh, to climate change and to mitigate, so to reduce the impact, uh, no, the emissions of uh, uh, causing climate change. Water crisis, all these things are linked together. And see, they, they see that as the same kind of risk, with, this is lower probability, same kind of risk as weapons of mass destruction. So it's, it's um, startling to see that it's gone, you know, uh, really mainstream and, and it should be a clear sign that we should uh, start taking this into account. Obviously, it's not a risk for the future. It's been happening for, for many, many decades. But the problem is that between the emission of one ton of CO2 and its full effect on climate, there's a delay of 30 to 40 years. It's like smoking. If you smoke uh, five packs of cigarettes uh, for uh, three months in a row, uh, you won't die of lung cancer the, the month after that. There's a delay, it's, there, there's a lag. And that's what's happening uh, with, uh, with climate change. We've been mapping this for decades. We can find all kinds of signs. Um, and the energy that you're actually accumulating, just to give you one, one figure, is actually startling. When we talk about global warming, how much warming is there? It's the equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima-powered atom bombs every single day. That's the heat being released. This heat, 400,000 times every day, is being added to the reservoir that is our planet. And most of this heat is actually being absorbed by this reservoir. So we, we measure the temperature in the atmosphere, etc., but it's only the tip of the iceberg. Most of the heat is actually heating up the ocean and, and, and building up a heat reserve in, in layers that can be uh, surface layers or deep layers and we can very accurately measure that for many many years and we see it happening in front of us. Actually 50% of the heat increase has occurred in the last 20 years. So we, we, we really see this, uh, this change happening and we see the symptoms, the effects of this warming happening in front of us as well. Normal, normal typhoons, hurricanes, etc. get accelerated because there's more heat and more mass being fed into the storm system, so they are uh, more destructive and, and, and we can actually closely correlate that. And as there's more uh, evaporation in general, we see uh, phenomena of, of large precipitation occurring uh, very suddenly. There's no more rain or less rain, obviously, it's a closed system but it occurs in a shorter period of time, uh, causing uh, things like these that we've seen all around us. Now, 
some of the things that are there's something wrong with my projection, but it's okay. Some of the things that are really closely uh, related to uh, to the field that you are working in and was mentioned several times this morning is, for instance, the fact that uh, sea level rise is occurring now, and and this is what it looks like. This is the uh, Greenland uh, uh, ice layer, which is uh, up to three kilometers of ice on the rock that is causing rivers of melting water which flow into the sea and which actually cause already sea level rise right now. Communities around the world are starting to adapt or to move even, improvising often, you know, it's, it's the poorest communities for the moment who are the hardest hit, so they have to improvise sea walls, etc. Uh, ironically with uh, empty draw, uh, <laughs> oil uh, barrels that they construct this, uh, this uh, protection. And, and this morning also, uh, Frank mentioned, and, and, and Julius uh, referred to it as well, we see this incredible rise in population, and most of the people decide to settle on coastal region. Actually, half of the world's largest cities are uh, in coastal regions. And these regions are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, when you look at uh, what happens here, simulations for Shanghai, this is with uh, two degrees, if you go beyond two degrees at the end uh, of the century, there's actually very, very uh, little left. This is three and a half degrees. Uh, there's very little left of uh, uh, populations, um, no, four degrees, um, of uh, metropoles like uh, Shanghai and others. Um, it means an incredible uh, quantity of assets that are at risk. Um, and I'm not going to dwell too much on on, on, on the consequences, but I just want to give you a, a sense of, of what's at stake here. Also very close to home, obviously. Uh, this is something we set in motion, and uh, we are going to have to come to grips uh, with it. All right. Uh, maybe one thing to, to conclude here, the, the, the introduction on, on, on the severity. You could say, yeah, we have all kinds of other problems for the moment, financial instability, Europe is disintegrating, all the things we hear about uh, Trump and global trade wars and all of that. Can't we just park this and then come back in a decade or two and then we'll have super cheap uh, renewables and then we'll take it seriously? That would be ideal because it's, it's true, there's a lot on our plate. The thing is, we don't have that choice, we don't have the luxury to wait. There's a, a window of opportunity, uh, and if we miss it, we can actually create what is called um, a positive feedback cycle, something that actually will reinforce itself. So even if we were to completely decarbonize or defossilize uh, our economy by then, some mechanisms that are set in motion, like this for instance, uh, the, the smaller the eyes, the more heat absorption, the smaller uh, the ice becomes, etc. Uh, or other uh, uh, positive feedback cycle, like the fact that methane is being released when the North Pole ice decreases, leading to more warming, etc. These are called positive feedback loops. And once these are set in motion, you know, um, there's actually no way back. So that's why there's a sense of urgency. That's why 195 uh, countries came together uh, almost three years ago which is a really significant thing. It's a bit like uh, the, the uh, Declaration of Human Rights or something. Eh? They actually said, every, every country said, okay, we agree to work together to, towards an almost zero emission um, uh, target. And those are the targets that the nations propose here. At least the two degrees, but actually aiming for the green arrow. But then, if you look at the plans, the homework that these same 195 countries put together, it's this, it's this light orange package here. So they say we want this and we are, uh, we're ready to do this. For so there's a big uh, discrepancy here between uh, what we want and what we're actually uh, building. And um, that's why, um, you know, this is uh, um, becoming an issue. I'm skipping a couple of slides because I want to talk about the, the opportunities, but you can see how it's, uh, it's actually related. Maybe show one other uh, slide 
that will come up in the workshops. There's only, it's not only climate change, obviously, huh? all these elements are, are linked uh, uh, with one another. It's a very systemic uh, aspect, as you can see on the World Economic Forum uh, side also. Um, and to get out of that, we'll need to increase our productivity on, on all kinds of uh, fronts, materials, foods, but obviously producing more with less uh, uh, CO2 emissions. And we'll also have to deal with related problems that are linked to this uh, linear uh, economic model that we have, such as the plastic soup and several places uh, in the oceans. So all these issues bring us in a position where we, we face a number of really serious uh, issues, but our take at Future Proof that that's, you know, you can try to uh, conceal it or hope that somebody else will solve it, or you can see it as an opportunity. It's the basis uh, starting point of a business, actually. Somebody uh, wants to buy bread or doesn't find a good restaurant, you see that as a need, you create a, a, an opportunity, you, you create a service, and it's the basis for a good business. And that's how we want to look at it um, this afternoon as well. I don't know if you've seen this, anybody seen this news, it's a couple of months old. Um, it's quite significant because the International Marine uh, uh, Organization was kind of trying to not be included in the Paris Accord. Uh, recently they came out and said, you know, we are actually um, aiming towards at least 50% greenhouse gas reduction by 2050, but actually going beyond to uh, emission, uh, to be on, on the path consistent with the Paris Agreement. Now that path, you hear a lot of percentages uh, being thrown around, etc. Um, this is a really simple way to think about it and to remember it. It's quite simple, it's called Carbon Law. Johan Rockström published it last year, it's really very comprehensible. It's a, a short paper of, of four or five pages where he describes what this future would look like. When do we disconnect the last uh, gas uh, furnace in homes? When is the last uh, uh, fossil fueled car taken off of the streets, etc.? What, what does this future look like in ordinary life? And the, the, the rule of thumb that he proposes to remember what this path looks like is quite simple. Every 10 years, we will have our CO2 emissions. If, the, if we want to be on track with the, uh, the Paris Accord and be on the safe zone, that's what we need to aim for. Every 10 years, 50% reduction. At the same time, the renewables, the capacity of renewables should double every five years. And finally, this line here, the blue, uh, yeah, the dark blue, is we need to build up carbon sink capacities as well. And it's very, very relevant to a lot of the work, um, for instance, in, in uh, uh, working with nature and ecosystem services that some of you are doing, in which we rebuild the capacity of our planet to absorb CO2 and sequester it in oceans or in plants or in, in soils. So that's, that's the target. That's the... Uh, the trajectory we need to, uh, to be on. And so there's a couple of ways to look at it. You can say, okay, we're going to try to be compliant and we'll create a CSR team in our organization and uh, we'll do, you know, we'll publish a couple of nice sustainability reports. Maybe we'll buy two or three BMW hybrids in the fleet and talk a lot about it, do some events, maybe have a, a showcase eco product. That's what a lot of companies do. And I think uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, we believe it's Im imperative and much more lucrative and, and interesting to integrate that on the strateg strategic level and really think about the returns you can get by embarking on an ambitious low carbon uh, strategy. And we're actually not the only ones. <clears throat> Again, China was mentioned several times this morning. Um, it's incredible to see in such short time what a 180 degree turn China has made in terms of sustainability and low carbon emissions. Look at the first figure, for instance. In two years' time, they go from a growth of 3.7% in coal to a decrease of that same amount 
in coal-powered uh, um, electricity. So they've passed the peak in coal, while in other regions it's still growing. The, they account for more, you know, it's a 2016 figures, to more than 33% uh, of the worldwide renewable power. Their EV sales, uh, you know, beat everyone. Shenzhen, for instance, one city, uh, six months ago added 19,700 electric, fully electric buses. That's more than LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and New Jersey area combined. And we in Europe, we think there's a market of, for all of Europe, we think there's a market of 4,300 electric buses per year. So one city, 19,700. And so they just go ahead and um, it's going to be hard to, to play catch up if we uh, continue publishing sustainability reports for much longer. So our view is that it's time to think about what's in it for us now. Not in 20 years, not in 50 years. How can you convince investors, managers, managers CFOs, CEOs to, uh, to choose that direction? And this afternoon we'll brainstorm also what it means for your sector. Where could new opportunities be within one company or maybe within the sector uh, to capture the value that comes uh, out of this. And I'm going to run through these um, returns one by one with a couple of examples. The first one is reducing cost, obviously. If, if, you, if you do more with less energy, with less material, with less resources, uh, it's an immediate cost to your to a cost reduction, an immediate improvement to your bottom line, and it can be several things. Um, this is um, one of the examples on how big data informs better routing uh, of of uh, ships worldwide, and and how uh, on on several levels the the voyage data, the working of your machinery and engines, etc., and also the the AIS systems are actually being fed uh, with uh, uh, huge amounts of data to improve the logistics and to improve the occupation level to know uh, with your automatic information system, uh, you know, where you are, etc. It really uses this insight um, to improve your operations. And I don't know if you've seen this company, it's called planet.com. I'm going to run a, a short clip on it. imagery here, what's the metadata behind that imagery, and I would like to download that image. Our imagery is really powerful because it allows us to uncover things like deforestation, agricultural change, monitoring geopolitical developments, analyzing shipping activity in ports. Planet was founded to use space to help life on Earth, and we have the capability to image that, but now we can translate those images into a, a massive data set that actually allows us to tap into that daily variation in the Earth's surface to really see the planet change. You say, yeah, that's nothing new. Uh, satellite images have them for years. But what's new here is that if you want, in half an hour, you have an account. It's software as a service. You pay for an account. You have a free trial. And you can use it as you would use Google. You can search for a change in quantity of ships with this type of container in the port of Shenzhen over the last six months to see if economic activity goes up or down there. You can look for cargo ships. You can just Google and use this as a direct interface. There's one image per day, so you can see time series with an, an, an added layer of machine uh, learning and image recognition that you can just use as a very low cost, low threshold uh, technology. So you don't need to launch your own satellites or have hundreds of thousands of euro worth of, of contracts. It's just incredibly powerful and they have an API. So if you build software in your company, you can immediately integrate it and start, you know, integrating this uh, big data, but with a layer of machine intelligence and, and time processing. Uh, on it and it you can use it for all kind of things surveys validate your automatic information systems detect vessels track activity very very uh, interesting and and 
supply chains around the world are massively embracing this this new te technology to actually look at uh, you know uh, what they can do to optimize it to optimize the utilization the routing uh, etc so that's a very simple uh, example there are many many more but uh, that's directly related to uh, to what you do about the risks it's more complex and julius uh, and frank both uh, uh, show this potential futures in terms of uh, energy and, and uh, energy prices and uh, regulation, etc. Nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. Um, but one thing is for sure: sure change is going to be uh, sudden and, and uh, drastic in the, in the coming uh, years and decades. One aspect, for instance, that can be directly linked to the first drivers you talked, uh, uh, Frank talked about, about uh, the trade, trade capital, and trade maintenance. What if uh, this evolution that he pointed to become more significant? What if uh, insuring, reshoring, closed loop manufacturing, AI uh, and, and uh, robotics create a new kind of manufacturing revolution that completely change the need for these trades, for these <coughs> container ships to change? It's something that would uh, impact you dramatically. I show the example of Apple because it's a mainstream example dealing with huge volumes. They use it for, in part, as a PR, but it's also, uh, you know, really installed. Uh, and they are taking this seriously, so they're taking the lead towards closed-loop manufacturing for some of their products. A true innovation means considering what happens to a product at every stage of its life cycle. So this is um, minor, you're going to say yeah, iPhone 6 is whatever, but uh, you know, in 2011, for instance, in, in Hoboken in Belgium, Umicore betted on the fact that there would be a need for battery recycling. It was a bet at the time, seven years ago. Now we see that it's incredibly well paid off. If you see it, look at the stock price of Umicore and the importance of this division is becoming huge. And um, they, they predicted that and it's, it's uh, you know, it's a, uh, becoming a reality. And, you know, it's, again, uncertain, but there's one, um, if you're interested in this, there's a guy from Boston Consulting Group who has an interesting TED talk about this, in which he actually argues that this combination of AI, uh, robotics, and the, the closed loop ID could completely change the, the outlook of manufacturing and bring about a manufacturing revolution in which we will have much more closed cycles than... Um, than uh, uh, we are uh, used to have. Something, uh, a completely different risk, which is a bit related to the discussion and the prognosis that we had this morning, is who is going to be right about the, the, the future evolutions of our energy mix? If you know the energy, uh, International Energy Agency, based in Paris, they, they supply this World uh, Energy Outlook report. I think you pay tens of thousands of euros to get that. Uh, every year and I think in November uh, and they are they are an authority on you know what uh, what uh, uh, outlook will be and when you look at what they did in pr uh, uh, pronosticating or, or uh, pro uh, forecasting uh, the demand and the installed capacity in gigawatts of uh, solar for instance this these were the several the different reports it's you know more than 10 years old but still these were the prognosis in reality it's been more than 10x that. So it's not a rounding error, it's not 10 or 20 percent uh, margin uh, that you can have. It's completely underestimating the non-linear changes that can happen when we face uh, the future that is based on renewables that are actually using a learning curve. 
And that's, that's a key word here, a learning rate. It means that every time the capacity of a certain type of technology in wind or solar or microprocessor or, or DNA sequencing or whatever, there be, there's a learning rate bringing about an effect that this same technology will become X percent cheaper. So in this case, every time there's a doubling of installed solar, it, one unit of solar becomes 28% cheaper, which brings about more installations, etc. And that's an incredibly important notion to take with you because we tend to think in linear evolution. We think it's going to be a sequence of 10 or 15 or 20% improvements, uh, but actually it takes place non-linearly. And this brings about the fact that very soon uh, renewables will actually beat uh, conventional energy sources. When you purely look at the, the, the cost, the levelized cost of electricity and, and uh, uh, dollars per megawatt hour, you see that onshore wind uh, and utility scale PV in the US and uh, in China will actually beat them quite uh, fast. And, and the, the main thing to remember here is this difference between uh, the fact that fossil fuel systems are always dependent on an unknown, which is the fossil fuel price, which can vary wildly. If there's a tweet of Donald Trump, it could send up uh, your barrel uh, price up or down. Whereas technology-based systems, this is OPEX, this is CAPEX. Technology-based systems are much more predictable. You can have economies of scale, you can predict how this technology will evolve. And this, you know, again, we don't know for sure, but this is what Bloomberg New Energy Finance says, that uh, by 2030, they think, in terms of installed capacity, solar will beat uh, coal, and by 2030, uh, 39, it will be all fossil fuels. So it's not marginal and anymore, it's, you know, becoming the dominant form uh, of energy. And yesterday, no, two days ago, there was a new report published, there's an article in the Guardian, which said, if this happens, if this sudden demand in fossil fuel happens here, eh, it could happen before 2035, if this happened, this could spark an incredible uh, economic crisis. It's a bit like, um, um, I don't know if anybody has seen this movie, the Big Short? Anyone? Yeah? One or two? Or read the book? Couple? It's the same thing. It's a, an incredible book and movie. It's actually describing how a few um, investors saw the subprime crisis arriving in 2007, 2008 and bet against the market. They shorted the market. They bet against it and they became multi-billionaires. Uh, fantastic uh, movie. Um, and what happened there is actually that there was a gap between the valuation of a home, let's say 200,000 euro, and the real value of that home, 40,000 euro or something like that. And exactly the same thing is happening if we take climate change seriously in terms of fossil intensive assets. If you have a fleet that only runs on fossil, or if you are Exxon or, or Shell, etc., and your whole business depends on selling, extracting, burning fossil fuels. And if at the same time the world agrees to sticking to two degrees or even one and a half degrees, it means that most of the value in our portfolio or in your assets is unusable, is unburnable and actually create the potential for what they call a stranded assets. So that, that's what this, uh, this new uh, report uh, talks about this. It's really, really well uh, uh, explained that, uh, uh, in that uh, article by the Guardian. And again, he also here, it's not Greenpeace, it's not uh, uh, only uh, dark green people, it's also, for instance, the central banker of the UK who starts to warn people about this uh, and companies about this risk. Okay, let's move on. So stranded assets, yeah, you can have an idea of what, uh, what this will look like. And we've been there in the past, you know, incumbents who think 
they're too big to fail and that uh, digital photography is not a threat. Actually, Kodak had the first patents on digital photography. I don't know if you remember that, but it's quite, uh, quite surprising uh, to see that. Anyway, um, and then the next possible return, which is, I think, uh, incredibly uh, interesting and, and which also should be the focus of, uh, of our uh, exercise this afternoon, is how can these changes, these threats, these you know, uh, new guidelines and, and regulations that come towards us, how can they spark new business ideas? And how can we actually be part of that, uh, that new uh, economy? And there's a number of things, I, I split it up in between climate change mitigation and adaptation. If you look at the amount of investments that will be made by between now and 2040 in, in new energy generating capacity, it's quite startling. Yeah? It's 10, uh, 10 trillion, 10,000 billion uh, dollars. And most of it will go to uh, zero carbon sources. So actually three quarters will be uh, uh, wind and, and solar. And the landscape will shift dramatically. Again, ne nobody knows, but it's Bloomberg New Energy Finance. From what we see here, more than half being fossil based to just a small part still uh, being uh, that thing. We can argue forever about who's going to be right, but what I just want to give to you, uh, find out for yourself. There are great resources, very um, easily digestible presentations and reports that you can find on the site of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Look at the research and, and uh, integrate it in your uh, business because we believe it's going to have an incredible impact. And again, the opportunity, you know, uh, you know probably much better than us, what happened 10, 15 years ago. People thought some companies were crazy to start building uh, wind, uh, wind turbines uh, offshore and it's been exploding uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, you are probably involved in uh, at least uh, several of those, those projects uh, uh, right next door and across uh, the world. It's happening uh, in front of our eyes and it's incredibly exciting to see the growth of this uh, uh, offshore uh, wind market and installation. Um, and again, with that, you see this learning rate, it's actually happening right there. Uh, and Bloomberg was wrong, they say it themselves, huh? offshore wind has surprised. This was their prognosis about how the price, the levelized cost of electricity would decrease. This is the reality. Also, they have been surprised about how uh, low and how fast, this is Krieger's flag here, um, this uh, uh, unit price could rise. And it's probably not, not uh, done yet because uh, we're going now to 12 megawatt uh, turbines uh, and, and others. Uh, and we see that offshore wind also becomes very competitive compared to other uh, sources of uh, fossil fuel. And that it provides a more stable generation profile than um, what we have uh, with onshore. And this is a big deal. A couple of uh, weeks ago, this was published in the Guardian as well, which for the first time in a whole quarter went uh, production in terawatt hours uh, surpassed the nuclear uh, production. So it's moving in a great direction, uh, we believe, uh, but there's still a lot of uh, unknowns. <laughs> All right, skipping a couple of slides here. So that's the opportunity in, in uh, uh, mitigation, reducing, and there's many, many more than that. But this is another uh, uh, opportunity which is really uh, right up your alley. We see the banner uh, uh, of working with nature here in the, in the hallway. Um, and I believe the combination of both providing this pathway to fossil free energy by going for offshore wind and solar and all of that, and combining that with ecosystem services, coastal defenses, uh, ecosystems rehabilitating, uh, rehabili rebuilding is, is an incredibly interesting um, uh, crossover. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's all kind of thing. It's flood defenses, of course, uh, uh, for, for one, but it's also restoring those ecosystems that, that have been degraded and, and trying to actually provide value to 
coastal uh, uh, communities and creating deltas uh, and cities in which these elements of protection and food production and, and uh, yeah, biodiversity are, are all um, integrated. One example um, that's uh, interesting is to see what they did on the, the Hudson Bay after they had uh, the Hurricane Sandy, uh, you, you remember. Um, they, they created a plan in which these, all these elements came together. So coastal protection and, and installation of the shore, uh, integrated possibilities for, for tourism, integrated habitat for uh, uh, spawning of fish and, and new uh, species, and at the same time dramatically improving uh, or decreasing the risk for, for flooding for uh, the coastal um, communities. This is what would happen without, what happened actually uh, during Sandy, this is what would happen with the new installation of this, uh, uh, these coastal regions in which you have quite important uh, wave reduction while at the same time you improve the ecosystems. Uh, again, there's uh, banners talking about uh, rebuilding these reefs, etc. just outside. All these elements are new fields that we will need more and more. And this is not just, you know, uh, for, again, for nature lovers, it's an incredibly important aspect to rebuild our resiliency, but also to increase the health of the oceans and improve the capacity to absorb uh, CO2 and rebuild our carbon uh, sinks. Finally, here another uh, aspect, we talked about it uh, quite a bit and, and uh, it's nothing new. All the efforts that are linked to uh, cleaning up this uh, plastic soup are on the way. Nobody has a real good scalable solution yet, uh, but it's uh, been in the, at the forefront of, uh, of everybody's, um, you know, of, of the news uh, lately. Uh, so we believe this is uh, an incredible opportunity. If somebody finds a way to, uh, to solve this in a profitable way, uh, there's uh, decades of work to be done uh, there as well. I have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to be very quickly uh, uh, quick about this one and then brief you about some of the aspects on the, on the, on the workshop. The final thing, after having reduced your cost, anticipated risks about all these changes that, that are coming. After seeing new business opportunities in, in renewables and, and ecosystem services and, and thinking about that, uh, what René talked about is, is also, you know, there's a story to be told. There's a way to improve your, uh, your brand. And uh, it's maybe the most superficial thing to do, but it's important nonetheless, because it inspires other sectors to follow suit. It inspires other people to say, ah, they are profitable, they do, they have a mission, and they are creating a, a better world while being financially uh, successful. Um, some of the examples there, uh, actually I have only one that I want to show now. It's this, uh, what they do with the Boring Company. You know, who knows the Boring Company? Many people do. It's one of the many projects of, of Elon Musk. Um, there's actually making tunnels uh, and, and reinventing the way cities are connected. Because we say we build more and more cities in 3D and our uh, mobility network is to, still 2D. Why wouldn't we use uh, tunnels to actually improve the way uh, we uh, deal? And again, you could say, yeah, well, it's nice. It's easy to make a, a render and, and talk about uh, fancy things. Uh, but they're actually doing it. That's, that's the cool thing about it. They're actually uh, doing it. They just finished the first uh, test tunnel uh, under LA. In a couple of weeks or months, they are going to provide uh, rides for the public. And then uh, they are going to start to uh, see if people are uh, uh, ready to, uh, to pay for it and how the business model would work. This is what, what they just did uh, publish a month ago. First. Uh, tunnel under LA is almost done. Um, so by doing that, you know, uh, they, they tackle something that people said, yeah, it's not possible, uh, it's too expensive, etc. And their mission is very simple. They want to make one kilometer of tunnel a factor 16 cheaper than what it is now. And they're going to try to do it. They test it, they reduce the diameter, etc. 
who knows? We'll see if, uh, if they can revolutionize tunnel building as they did with uh, space travel and uh, 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 mobility. So those four. In a moment, René is going to talk you through uh, what we do for the workshops. There are two uh, workshops. But I want to briefly highlight what we want to take uh, into consideration in terms of innovation in our uh, workshop. This is what we are going to look at. Uh, this is called the Innovation Spectrum. It's from uh, McKinsey or Boston Consulting, in, in, say, in which they say you can innovate by slightly tweaking existing products for an existing market. Or you can address a new market, or change the, your product offering, or you can do both together. And very briefly, a couple of examples. Uh, transformational is the iPhone. Ten years ago, the iPhone was introduced. Completely new market for Apple, and a completely new uh, offering. There were some smartphones that could do a couple of bit baby internet kind of things, but nobody uh, offered a full-fledged uh, phone like they did. So they completely transformed the market and all other competitors followed suit. Adjacent is more what Amazon does. They are very good. They started with books. They were very good at the logistics and handling all of the books, uh, etc. Get them uh, to the customers. They build a whole machine behind that, which is, you know, the software machine, the logistics machine on how, the, how they run this operation. And then sector by sector, they moved to new markets with the same offering. And now there's hardly a retail sector that is not touched by Amazon. They bought Whole Foods last year, so they are into food as well, uh, any possible sector, but always with the same kind of machinery behind it uh, on uh, transforming uh, their business. And a core optimization would be this interface, for instance. Uh, they are the larger producer of a carpet tile in which uh, you know, they provide very nice office car carpet tiles, but here with networks they actually started working with Philippine fishers who would go and fish, not for fish, but for uh, old fishing nets that ap apparently pollute the ocean in, in many areas. And it's an excellent material, it's nylon 6, so it's an excellent material in terms of ductile uh, uh, capacity, ductile strength. And they transformed that into a product uh, called Networks, uh, which is very successful. And so it's not aid, they're not helping or giving handouts to those communities. They're actually, it's trade. They, uh, instead of overfishing, they fish for waste. They get a, a healthy income and they have a, a closed loop uh, resource to build uh, new products with. Two last slides. So that's my call to you. You know, let's take off the responsibility hat and say we have to save the planet, we have to do this, and we have to uh, uh, think about 2050. And let's put on the response, uh, the opportunity hat. Where, where are there opportunities for us? Set out a clear, bold vision. Think about what your customers face in terms of challenges. Think in whole systems. I, I showed uh, several examples, but most of them cross over. And then also think uh, about how in what areas you will be there as a company and at what areas you can work together as a sector, a bit like the, the Tour de France analogy that uh, Julius uh, mentioned um, a while ago. If we do this, we have a chance of not being one of those, not investing in the, future, in the past, but being shapers uh, of the future. And it's going to be badly needed uh, because when you look at the targets that were put out by the Paris Accord, and when you look at the reality, the speed with which we are hurling towards those targets, uh, we need big changes rapidly. And it's up to us to choose the kind of future we are going to end up. Will we be stuck in the past? And, and as the, the, the community on the Easter Island, at their peak of their capacity, a couple of decades later, were completely uh, obsolete, or are we going to be shaping smart, sustainable cities and, and moving off of fossil fuels into a future that's much more attractable, attractive than what it is now, but also provides economic growth and opportunity for the decades to come. The choice is ours, and I hope that this afternoon 
you will actually uh, help uh, uh, generate ideas and opportunities and be part of this uh, exciting new future. Thank you.